Are you afraid of dying? No, not at all. Do you think you go somewhere? Uh, no. The one thing I can't understand, I can't grasp my mind around, I feel when you die, there's just nothing. It's like when you're asleep and you're not dreaming. But I can't imagine nothingness lasting forever. What's the secret to a long life? I have no idea. To me, it's still been a short life. I hope it goes on a lot longer. I, I, I think being interested in what you're doing. Um, I know my father, the poor guy, it was during the depression and he was out of work most of the time. So his life was shorter and it was because there was nothing really that he was doing that could interest him. But I think if you do what really excites you, it just keeps you going as, as long as possible. How do you keep the creative juices flowing oh. to keep creating work over the years? I'm doing what I enjoy doing. It's like other men like to play golf, so they play golf every chance they can. So you don't say to them, how come you're playing golf today? You played last week. It was the same with me. To me, it's an exciting life. And when you do something that you know the fans seem to enjoy, that gives you such satisfaction, you don't want to stop. One thing you change about the world. What would I change? I'd make people not hate each other because of their religion, because of their nationality, Stupidity. because of any stupid reason. If we could abolish hatred, we live on this gorgeous planet. There's a character I wrote called the Silver Surfer, and I always had him making those kind of remarks, philosophical things about, he was from another world. And he said, why don't we realize we're on a planet that gives us everything, food, beautiful weather, sun, everything. Why don't we enjoy it? Why do we spend time fighting and hating each other? I loved riding the Silver Surfer. You are basically a child at heart, aren't you? I guess. Yeah. How did you get into comic books? B purely by accident. I guess when I went to work for Marvel, which then was called Timely Comics, it was the very early 1940s, and um, I had a job there as I was sort of the office boy. I, in fact, I didn't know I was going to be doing comics. It was a publishing company, and I heard they wanted, they had, there was a job open for an assistant. Now, they also published men's magazines, movie magazines, sport magazines, and they had a little comic book section somewhere that I, I, I was hardly aware of. So I applied for the job, and I found out it was for the comic book department. And there were only two people running that department, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. And I started working for them. I filled the ink wells. In those days, people used ink. And I erased pages, and I went down and got them sandwiches for lunch and stuff like that. After a while, they left. And it had been a three-man department, and now I was the only man left. And the, I was about 17 and a half, and the uh, publisher came over to me and said, do you think you can keep things going till I find a grown-up, you know, to, to run the place? <laughs> well, when you're 17 and a half, what do you know? I said, sure, I can handle it. So I guess I did, because he never found that grown-up, and I was there ever since. Which character, which story, makes you was the first one where you felt I'm on to something here. I'm not just writing fight scenes for a dollar. I, I got something here. I guess the first Fantastic Four story, because that was the first one that I wrote <clears throat> the way I really wanted to write it. Up until then, I was just trying to please my publisher. And he had no respect at all for the readers. He thought they were either very, very young children or semi-literate adults. And he felt, just give them action, that's all they want. So with the Fantastic Four, I tried to do some character development. I gave each one his own distinctive way of speaking, things like that. And that was not what my publisher had wanted. And the reason I did it was, I was thinking of quitting at that point. And my wife said to me, before you quit, why don't you get it out of your system? Do one story the way you'd want to. The worst that could happen, he'll fire you, but you want to quit anyway. So that's when I did the Fantastic Four. And strangely enough, 
it sold very well. So my publisher came in and he said, hey, how about doing some more superheroes? The one thing I would suggest is it's important to please the person you're working for and so forth, but you've got to please yourself. You've got to do something you think is terrific something you would love to see if somebody else had done it. If you have an idea that you genuinely think is good, don't let some idiot talk you out of it. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that every wild notion you come up with is gonna be genius, but if there is something that you feel is good, something you want to do, something that means something to you, try to do it. Because I think you can only do your best work if you're doing what you want to do, and if you're doing it the way you think it should be done. And if you can take pride in it after you've done it, no matter what it is, if you can look at it and say, I did that and I think it's pretty damn good. That's a great feeling. So don't let idiots <laughs> talk you out of something that you think is good. By the same token, that doesn't mean every single thing you think is, gonna, is good is gonna be win a prize. Gotta have a little judgment there. I've had other things that I thought were good that didn't work, but my publisher came to me and he said, Stan, I want you to come up with another superhero. So I said, okay, and I went home and, and I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And I said, hey, if I could get a superhero that could stick to walls and crawl on them, man, that would be cool. So I thought that was good. Now I needed a name. So I said, well, let's see, Fly Man, Mosquito Man. I got down to Spider Man. Spider Man. It just sounded dramatic. So, okay, I had my hero. I had his power, his name. And then I figured just for fun, I'm going to give him personal problems. Then I thought I'd make him a teenager, because there were no teenage superheroes that I knew of at the time. So armed with all that wonderful material, those great ideas, I ran into my publisher's office and I told him. This was the reaction he gave me. Stan, that is the worst idea I have ever heard. First of all, people hate spiders, so you can't call a hero Spider-Man. You want him to be a teenager? Teenagers can only be sidekicks. And you want him to have personal problems? Stan, don't you know what a superhero is? They don't have personal problems. Well, I left the office disappointed, but obviously a much wiser man. And I couldn't get Spider-Man out of my system. So we were about to kill a magazine. I think it was called Amazing Fantasy. Just to get it out of my system, I put Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy, featured him on the cover, forgot about it. A month later, all the sales figures came in. My publisher came racing into my office. Stan, Stan! You remember that character we both loved so much, Spider-Man? <laughs> Let's do him as a series. Are there some real-life modern-day heroes in your mind? Um, Who in the world do you admire a lot? There are a lot of servicemen that I meet when I go to conventions and we talk. People in service in this country I have great admiration for. I have great admiration for people who do anything well. I don't care whether it's writing or drawing a comic book or making neckties or athletics or any, anybody who does something well, I admire. Tell me about uh, Meeting meet Stan. Well, first of all, I, I, I love what you said. And uh, let me just say to the family uh, and to the legions of fans uh, that I remember Stan as a true gentleman who had this glint in his eye. He's a creative genius. He thought outside the box. He created a whole universe that changed the lives of many people, mine included. Stan, God bless you. You're one of the greats. Hi, heroes. This is Stan Lee coming at you. Want you to know, Marvel has always been and always will be a reflection of the world right outside our window. That world may change and evolve, but the one thing that will never change 
is the way we tell our stories of heroism. Those stories have room for everyone, regardless of their race, gender, religion, or color of their skin. The only things we don't have room for are hatred, intolerance, and bigotry. That man next to you, he's your brother. That woman over there, she's your sister. And that kid walking by, hey, who knows? He may have the proportionate strength of a spider. We're all part of one big family, the human family. And you, you're part of that family. You're part of the Marvel Universe that moves ever upward and onward to greater glory.